Right Honourable Judge Paul John Brophy Burke. <laughs>
and the general sort of real meaning of Christmas and the real meaning of Santa Claus could be lost by impossible. Have you evidence? Yes, my lord. We have lots of evidence, and we will, which we will take you through in more detail now, if, if, if you can bear with me. This is, this is not the first time that this man has been accused of impersonating. No, he has a history of impersonating, and if, if you could bear with me, maybe I could just refer to some of my notes. Of he. Uh, he would be fit, would have been accused before of uh, impersonating Roy Hubley from Forest Hills. He's also been seen accused of impersonating a Bulgarian major. And we would have seen him along the river that boy impersonating Bert. Not to mention Abenazar and Baron Harder would have always been uh, favourites of his impersonation. But enough, enough about that. Let's move on to what they are. More importantly, I suppose the most serious previous form that this man would have in relation to impersonation would that he would have been seen to impersonate, quite openly and frequently seen to impersonate a man, a, a decent rural farmer from West Kerry, known to many of you as the Bull McKinn. <laughs> now, not only did he impersonate, but this man went further than that. He went and got commissioned photographs and pictures of them himself and erected them all over the town of that boy, <laughs> claiming to be the bull Michael. Oh. If I may be so good, Coulter, maybe you'd show us exhibit A, which explain in more detail what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Many reported sightings around uh, the suburbs of Kentucky, but this man going round the field muttering to myself, It is my field. <laughs> but it may jest to somewhat, but this is serious, ladies and gentlemen, because of the consequences of what we have. We have a man who thought he was the bull in the cave, and now this man seriously thinks he is Santa Claus. <laughs> and if I could call on you again, Porter as we were doing some investigation of this house, we came across some items of clothing which may be of interest to you. It seems to be about the correct size, actually. <laughs> now, if I could be good, I uh, call my first witness, Keen Harms. <clears throat> the court calls the first witness, Mr. Keen Harms. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Harms. Place your hand upon the 50th anniversary <laughs> of that boy, you're right. Repeat after me. I can ham. Take you as my wife. I can ham the wrong script. I can ham and swear to tell the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me, Father Pat. <laughs> Available for five euro today. <laughs> Jury of the benefit of the jury today. 
Do you really feel that this man is Santa Claus, or is he off? <laughs> What makes you think this man is an imposter? <laughs> More importantly, short beard and poor quality present you at the top. Thank you very much, Keith. You're free to stand up, unless my learned colleague has any questions. No, yeah, not at the moment, sir. No. <laughs> You can see from what we've heard here before that this is not a once-off. This is not a once-off prank or enjoyment that somebody wanted to be sacrificed for a few hours. This man has a repeated, he's a repeated serial offender. A serial re-offender of impersonation. Jury, I'm asking you to think hard about this man. This man needs to be stopped. This man needs to be put away. Your community needs the right decision. I rest my case. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Mr. Smith, it's quite a serious case you have to answer. Indeed, Your Honour. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, people of that boy, I wish to state at the outset, Your Honour, that I, having spoken at length over the Christmas period of my time, during which he repeatedly insisted he represents himself. <laughs> I managed to convince him otherwise. I represent Charlie Smith here today, and I do so uh, to inform the, the clerk of the court uh, under the freely laid scheme. <laughs> Never before have I lowered my professional dignity. <laughs> myself needing the money. <laughs> Hands are hard on us all, Mr. Smith. Carry Indeed. on. Indeed. In view of the evidence put forward by my learned colleague, Mr. Cook, <coughs> we have decided to plead guilty to the charge. <laughs> and I believe, Your Honour, there are mitigating circumstances in relation to my client. First of all, could I point out that my client is a man of simple intellect. <laughs> he is vulnerable to suggestion. And could be described by many as a man of diminished responsibility. He has had some very traumatic experiences during his life and come under the influence of some very unsavory characters. At a crucial time in his young life, my client was taken from his local tribe and transferred to another local tribe who were singularly lacking in culture. <laughs> and indeed, when involved in sporting activity, were de described as complete savages. <laughs> I would also like to add that as part of the transfer, he was lured by me. He was lured by means of a woman. <laughs> Daughter of a local chieftain. She promised him many things. Happiness, love, land, and let's not deny it. And there it was. He moved to the local tribe, and Charlie Smith settled, spent time there, and at an early stage in his life, before the moved, <coughs> he became involved with a subversive organization called Mintrum <laughs> Namakra. And it was during his association with this organization that he came under the influence of a very dangerous individual. And hereby lies the crucial evidence in our case here today. We cannot name the individual who dominated and influenced my client, but he shall be known for the purpose of the court as EC. <laughs> And during this 
time and his involvement at EC, he developed a weakness for impersonating other people. Now, this individual actually encouraged my time to engage in these impersonations and taking advantage of his weak state of mind, he actually managed to convince him that he could act. <laughs> when it was perfectly clear to everyone else that he couldn't. <laughs>
would think that this county could win a Leinster title. Indeed, I would suggest that someone waved a blue and gold jersey here this evening. We would see the reaction that I speak. And the second and more recent example of how my, my poor client cannot be trusted in what he says was at a local meeting at the Purchasing Group when he stated clearly at the opening of the meeting that he would not be re-elected chairman, but was easily convinced otherwise by the end. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, given the evidence that I've given to you here today, Your Honour, I must conclude that my client should be released from the hall <coughs> A free man. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So just to so that I have it for myself, you're essential to the knob of your case that your client is mad. <laughs> <laughs> no, Your Honor. Um, he is of diminished responsibility, simple intellect, and these things have contributed to his presence. These are mitigating factors in, in mitigating the charge against him. Yes, yeah. but I would not use your language. <laughs> <laughs> this is my court, Mr. Smith. I use what language I can. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> He's more likely, to, less likely to follow you than me. <laughs> Mr. Cook, have you anything to say in response? Or does that conclude? Uh, no problem. No problem. No problem. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, does the defendant wish to say anything himself while I consider matters? <laughs> you may speak now, Mr. Smith. This may be the only opportunity you get. I suppose the half hour spar what you all this, no? No, no, Your, your Honour, I am plenty to say. I'm a poor man. I have a large wife and family. <laughs> I have a wife and a large family. <laughs> I live a stressful life. I have to contend with the men that come fairly barbed on a daily basis. And furthermore, I was forced, forced to impersonate awful people in the lake of the Yabanaza by one man as my, my learned friend by the name of E.C. <laughs> and, uh, and that is why I, I like to impersonate Mr. Claus because he's a nice man and it clears my mind of those other horrible men that I, I have been forced to impersonate <laughs> and <clears throat> and I want to state categorically here and now that I have cut all my ties with this munches and mockra crowd because I've had an awful terrible influence on my life and 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 I I, I, I promise I will dedicate my life from here on in to, to charitable work like like helping the, 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 uh, the, the underdeveloped hurlers <coughs> of, of a fine <laughs> <laughs> to have them won a senior championship in over 32 years and, and if nothing is done they'll be, they'll be known as the forgotten people so I will dedicate my life and last but not least I'm going to throw myself on the mercy of the court <laughs> of the broken man of the broken man <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Smith, for that impassioned plea. <laughs> we are all human here. We consider the plight of all the defendants that have come before this court. But, ladies and gentlemen, on a day like this, you know, and I understand that this courthouse is 150 years old, and, and I'm quite certain that while there may have been many cases in this court, none has complicated as this one before me today. On the <coughs> one hand, I have this compelling list of impersonations uh, carried out by the defendant, Mr. Smith.
did. Now, the fact that they were horrendously bad impersonations <laughs> is irrelevant uh, to my considerations here this morning. In fact, if he was accused of being a good actor, he would probably be acquitted straight away. <laughs> but his biggest crime, and I use the sense crime in inverted commas, was that he thought <coughs> he was a good actor. And this is a crime that I'm afraid, Mr. Smith, you will take with you to your grave. Now? <laughs> the case. Oh, no, 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 I'm not finished yet. The case made by the defence, however, that he was under the influence of disreputable people is a very valid one. Some of his associates are extremely lucky that they're not before me today. In fact, if they were here, I would have no difficulty in locking them up for a very long time. In particular, the subtle reference as you made to E, C. <laughs> it's quite clear to me that, Mr. Smith, you're incapable of committing these types of offences of your own free will. In fact, I doubt that you actually have any free will. <laughs> Particularly when that tribe from the neighbouring parish used a woman to lure you over there to their side. You conceded all your free will to them and also to her. <coughs> and, and I think you're a man to be pitied. I understand from the evidence before me that he has indeed been booed on many of his public appearances in the past. But I am impressed by the contrite manner in which you've approached this case, Mr. Smith. And I think rather than me sit here in this chair and give judgment of a verdict, I think it's appropriate that the assembled members of this community, the jury of his peers, should decide Mr. Smith's fate. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I put it to you, is Charles John Hume Smith guilty or not guilty? Crucified. Who speaks? How does the jury find guilty or not guilty? Guilty. guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, this court is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>